Hey, thanks so much for tuning into the Globe Church, and we hope that this sermon would be a blessing to you. We love making these resources available, but we want to make sure that people don't treat this as a substitute for going along to church in person. If you're in London, why not come join us at Globe Church on a Sunday? You can find all the details on our website. If you're not in London and you're not involved in a local church, why not find one near to you and get stuck in, gather with God's people, hear God's words, and learn more of Jesus? God bless you. I hope you enjoy the sermon. And just to say, if you're, if you're new here, um, or if you've joined us very recently, ordinarily what we'd do is we'd work through a book of the Bible. That's, that's what we tend to do. We want to see the whole counsel of God proclaimed, um, and that's what we typically do. But we're currently in a series called Encounter, where we're really thinking about what it means to worship God together. Uh, and so it's a little bit more thematic. Um, so if you listen to last week, some of the week before, you'll hear different passages and sometimes dotting around different passages. Uh, so... This is not something we ordinarily do, but it's something we're exploring together, and particularly in this service called Encounter. Um, but today we're going to actually sit in this, primarily in this passage, because Romans 12 teaches us a lot. And we're looking really about that theme of encountering God as we serve together uh, in service. So that's the kind of big theme that we're looking at this afternoon. But let me read uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 1 to 13. Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts. According to the grace given to each of us, if your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Let me pray as we come to to God's word. Father, help us to hear your voice now in this this hot afternoon. Father, help us to be alert and to hear you speak to us through Romans, to help us to see what it means to offer up our bodies as living sacrifices for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let me ask you this. How excited do you get when someone says, can you serve? Genuinely, do you get excited when someone, can you, can you help out this, with this? Can you serve? Does it fill your heart with excitement and joy? You're like, yes. I'll be honest with you, there are times when it doesn't for me. There are times when I'm like, oh, why do I, do I have to do this now? Really? Do you ever get that? Or maybe you're much godlier than I am. But See, many of you here are involved in some type of serving at the church. But the question is, what drives you? Why do you do it? Why do you give up so much of your time to serve? You might have different answers, lots of different answers to that. Perhaps you, you just see a need, and you're that type of person. You see a need, I've got, I need to go plug that gap, I need to fix that problem. Or it's, perhaps it's because people have said, you, you're really good at this, you should try doing it. And you're like, okay, well, I'll give it a go. Perhaps you maybe feel a bit guilty, oh, maybe I should do something, I ought to do something. We often have this sort of thinking about serving. It's it's just something we do because we're Christians. The church asks us to do it, so we just do it. But this afternoon, I want us to think about this more carefully, about what serving really is. Because I want us to see that it's one of the best ways, actually, to encounter God in worship. Here's a big thing this afternoon. I know it's a hot afternoon, so if if you (laughs) start dozing off, it's fine. Please don't. But (laughs) if you do, remember this one thing. So now you don't switch off after this, but... Remember this one thing. If you want to encounter God in worship, then serve him. If you want to encounter God in worship, then serve him. Because serving is worship. 
I find this really challenging because I don't think it's a natural way we think about worship. As I was reflecting on this passage in Romans, I sort of started thinking of how I view worship. And often we can have this thin view of worship, which actually leads us to have a thin encounter with God. It's a bit like, um, it's like eating a trifle. If you know what a trifle is, <laughs> I'm already talking about food. If you were here last week, we were talking about the Lord's Supper and all my, a lot of my illustrations were about food and how I love it. Here we go. Imagine eating a trifle. You know a trifle with layers? You've got the cream on top with the raspberries and stuff. And then you've got like sponge and then fruit and then jam and then sponge and you can keep going. Like it's amazing. And you see this whole thing. But we always get tempted to do this, don't we? We see it sitting there and you just go, I take that raspberry and like, oh, that's nice. Or you go, take that cream, oh, that's nice. That is a thin view of the trifle. You're not experiencing it in its full thing. The person who made that trifle wants you to do, get a, you know what? They want you to get something like this and just take that whole scoop and enjoy all the flavors of it to see its fullness, the thickness of it. That is what they want you to do. And the point is we can sort of do that with worship. With a thin view of worship, we start kind of siloing worship into these layers and think, oh, worship is when we sing together over here or when we pray together over here or when we hear a sermon over here. And for sure, in those moments, we do have deep encounters with God in worship. But Paul takes that and says, no, no, no. There's more to worship than that. There's more to encountering God in worship than just those things. Did you notice as I read the the passage, end of verse 1, did you hear that phrase? This is your true and proper worship. See, Paul wants us to have this thicker view of what what worship means, where we have a fuller picture of what it means to encounter God. He wants us to see that worship isn't just when we gather at certain moments, as important as those are, and we have been exploring those together in this series. We've been thinking about what it means to pray together, to have the Lord's table together. In a couple of weeks, we're going to be thinking about what it means to sing together. And he's not pitching these against each other, as some people sometimes unhelpfully do. But what Paul does want to do is to show us that there is a broader view of what worship is. And it's about all of life. It's to offer up our bodies as living sacrifices. It's to serve God with a whole body, strength, soul, and mind. Whether that is singing wholeheartedly to one another on a Sunday, which is sort of why we're sitting like this. Or whether it's just taking some cookies around someone's house because you know that they're in need. Wholehearted service is what true and proper worship looks like. So we don't serve because we ought to, because we're told to, or because it's a nice thing to do, as good as those reasons are. But we serve because it's how we rightly worship God. And through that, we get to encounter him more richly and deeply. Let's have a look more closely at the text as to why we can make that conclusion. If you look at verse 1, what sort of language do you pick up here? You see those words, offer, sacrifice, holy, pleasing. What do these remind you of? This is the, the language that we hear when God's people would gather in God's presence at the temple to worship him. Even that word there for worship is one that's often used in the context of temple worship. And the way that they would come into God's presence to encounter God would be to bring an animal of sacrifice. It had to be alive for the priest to check over. It was to be holy, set apart, meaning it was to be pure without blemish. And it was to be pleasing. It wasn't the scrawniest little runt that you have, but it's a choice lamb, the meatiest lamb, the fattest lamb. And that is what entitled true and proper worship in a temple. That is how the people came to encounter God in his presence in right worship. And Paul is saying now, things have changed. No longer do we have this physical sacrifice in a physical temple. It's about a a spiritual sacrifice. And and what we do with that is with our own bodies. You and I, we are now the choice lambs set apart for God. What's changed? Here's the reason. We're working back through verse 1. The foundation for us offering our bodies as a living sacrifice starts at verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. This has been Paul's entire argument that he's building throughout the book of Romans. 
We are living sacrifices because of God's great mercy to us. Now, I know a lot of churches go through the book of Romans in like five years. They go through verse by verse. Here's me trying to summarize it in 30 seconds. <laughs> but look, here's Romans 1. We see how rebellious humanity is, how God hands us over to our desires. And then in Romans 3, we see how nobody was righteous, not even one person. But God, in his great mercy, says, look, I'm not going to give you that judgment you deserve. Instead, he would send a holy, pleasing lamb, his own son who comes to make atonement for us, who comes to give us his righteousness, to cover over our sin. Still in Romans 3. Then Romans 4, so that by faith we can walk with Jesus and live with him. And we have new life in him, Romans 6. And so as Christ died and was raised to life, so are we by the Spirit bound to him in our death and in our resurrection by faith, Romans 7 and 8. Now that, that's a really quick overview. Don't think we've done Romans. But that gives you a flavor of what it means in regarding God's mercy. To summarize it, it it's this. It all centers on Jesus. That's who we're about as a church. If you're joining us for the first, first time, this is what we do week in, week out. We just proclaim him. We focus on him, on all that he's done, because he is the complete epitome. He is the pinnacle of God's mercy. And that is why actually Paul is saying we are now living sacrifices. Because we live in Christ, in the one who died for us, who was raised to life and who reigns today, we are bound to him by faith. To the one who calls us and says, look, I am the bread of life. Come and feast on me. Who says, look, I am the one who gives eternal life if you believe in me. So here's something you need to hear this afternoon. Despite how we might feel as we come to church, despite how weak we might feel in our humanity, if you are trusting in Jesus, then our wholehearted acts of service are holy and pleasing to God. Because we're in Jesus by faith. We're in Christ, the one who was the perfect sacrifice, the holy one, without blemish, pure and sinless. Because we are in Christ, the one who was pleasing as the one and only Son of God, in whom God the Father said, I am well pleased. That is why in Jesus, we can offer up our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. Let me just pause here and say, look, if you're here this afternoon and you're, you're kind of exploring what we believe as Christians and you're not really sure about all this stuff, well, that is what, we're, what it's about. It's about God's mercy. It all pivots on Jesus. And so I'd urge you to keep coming back, to come and see Jesus week in, week out, to see how he is the perfect sacrifice who laid down his life for us, for you. Know that God's mercy is for you too. Jesus calls us to come to him. And I hope as we keep looking at these verses that you sort of have a window into why we as Christians, as a church, live this way in view of God's great mercy. Because he, Jesus, is the reason why we are able to offer up our bodies as living sacrifices. So look, to sum it up, is this. True worship is this. Offering up our bodies in Christ, like Christ. It's to be bound in Christ and offering up our bodies in service, just like Jesus did. It's to take up our cross daily and to follow him. It's to get on our knees and wash one another's feet, just like Jesus did. And so the question for us is, how much do we have God's mercy in full view? And how does that push us to serve wholeheartedly with our lives? A little, a little bit later, we're going to have a bit of time to pray. Perhaps that's what you could be praying God, help me to have a greater view of your mercy and through that, lead me, show me how I can serve you wholeheartedly this week, today, with my life. Okay, let's expand on this a little bit further. So serving is worship is what we've seen. But also serving reveals more of God's will. It helps us to know God's will more deeply. That's verse 2. See, in view of God's mercy, as we, as we wholeheartedly serve, we get to see more of God's will. Verse 2 is pretty clear. Living wholehearted lives of sacrifice for God reflects a transformation, a renewal of the mind, of our thinking, and our heart attitude. It's that, that Romans 6 idea. Our old self was crucified with him, 
and we are now united in his resurrection. So we no longer live in conformity to the patterns of this world. That is what it says in verse 2. And if you think for a moment about the service of the pattern in this world, why, do, why does this world provide services? It's primarily for self-gain. Whether this is financial or reputational, it's about building a platform around you. Either you provide a service that builds an empire or a brand or a reputation or, or followers. Think about Starbucks or influencers on social media. They provide services for us to enjoy so that they build their platform. Or you provide a service so that it builds a reputation so that people might like you. But here's the big thing. Without a view of God's mercy, even the kindest, most charitable acts are not pleasing to God in worship. See, in God's common grace, he may use a rich billionaire. Let's say Elon Musk decides to give out millions of his wealth to charitable causes. And that might help fund some good, helpful projects and causes, which God in his kindness uses to help people, whether they trust in him or not. But you know what? Your seemingly small act of helping to set up on a Sunday or cooking for somebody at church, in view of God's mercy, that is what is pleasing to God. That is what he sees as proper worship. That is what Paul's saying. True worship, right worship that pleases God comes from renewed minds that are transformed from within, that do not conform to the patterns of this world, that adorns and loves to serve self and not God. See, the problem with that billionaire is that they have a squeaky clean image with a great PR team. It looks clean on the outside, but they're filthy on the inside. They have no view of God's mercy. That is what Jesus kept pointing out to the Pharisees. You guys think you're clean on the outside, but it's from within your heart that's the problem. And God knows the depths of our hearts. If you are in Christ and trusting in him, he knows as we serve wholeheartedly with renewed minds, offering our bodies in sacrificial service to him, he knows you are worshiping him. And the beauty of this is, as we live in distinct service to God, in right worship, it helps us to go deeper with him, to encounter him more and more. Do you see that at the end of verse 2? we are able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. See, as we step out in wholehearted service of God, we not only encounter God in worship, but we are able to gain greater clarity of what God's will is. Let me try and, um, let me try and illustrate this. I need a, a volunteer. Anyone want to volunteer? Josiah, okay, Josiah. He's at the front. Okay, All right, you stand, stay there, stay there, stay there. All right, in this box, this is my will. My will is to give you something good. It is um, something you're going to enjoy. It's edible, obviously. Um, it's red. And so, see, I could keep going and telling him what my will is. But what's the quickest way for you to know what my will is? What? You can come. Yeah, show it. Yeah, okay. So what's there? There you go. Yeah, yeah this is for another illustration. See? Yeah, there you go. That's my will. Yeah, just keep them. Share them out, though. Okay, it's a slightly crude illustration. But the point is this. As he steps out in faith to, to, to sort of serve me, <laughs> as he steps out in faith and trust to say, okay, what's Mike's will? What's he trying to show me? In the same way, as we step out in faith and serve and offer up our bodies as living sacrifices, what we do is start encountering God's mercy in the joys and challenges of service to see, we start to see more clearly what God's will is. He starts to show us as we interact, as we serve, as we bump heads and shoulders, we start to see God's mercy at play and his will more clearly so that we can start to test it and discern it all the more. Let's start applying this. Let me tell you how these verses challenged me this week. Let me put it plainly. Look, I'm here to serve you as a pastor, as one of the pastors. Because I'm employed by you. It's my job. But that sort of thinking can begin to conform me to the patterns of this world. Where either I just start to coast and go, oh, I've got a, a job now, it's all good. Or I use this job to build a platform for myself. I joked about it with some of the staff team. Mike's on Ministries, MSM. It sounds pretty catchy. But you know what? These verses reminded me. I don't serve you because of that. I serve you because in, I have God's mercy in view. 
I serve you because Jesus came to serve me and not to be served. Because I have a Savior who has given me new life. And so I ask the Spirit to help me in this, to transform me so that I don't conform to the patterns of this world. Where I don't serve you to build a platform for myself. Woe to me if I ever build a platform called MSM. You, need to, you can hold me accountable that. If you ever, ever see it, you're like, Mike, what are you doing? No, I pray and I ask that he would help me to be renewed in my mind, to grow in my wholehearted service to you guys so that I may worship him rightly, so that I may know his will more clearly. Sisters, brothers, how might this challenge us this afternoon, today? Where could you, where could we be serving by faith? We have some kind of 20-odd different teams in the Globe Church. Could you get involved in one of those? Or perhaps you're already serving in some way, but do you need to realign the reasons for service? Do you need to renew your mind and grasp a deeper sense of God's mercies to say, that is why I serve? Because as you do that, not only is it right worship, true and proper worship, but you will go deeper with God, encountering him and seeing more and more of his will. Okay, let's keep thinking more practically. We're going to look at the rest of Romans 12, 3 to 13. And we're going to look at that particularly in the context of the church as we think about encountering God. What does it mean to serve together? And I just want to pick up four brief things for us to consider as we think about service. Encountering God in service. How do we do that well with each other? Here's the first thing. We serve one another in humility. Remember how we once lived, conforming to the patterns of this world, where it's all about building our platform, our brand, our ego, when in view of God's God's mercy, we now serve in humility. Do you see that in verse 3? For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. So this, this verse helps us to think carefully about what humility actually is. See, humility is not you thinking, oh, I'm just rubbish at everything. It's not thinking about uh, like less of yourself and putting yourself down. That is not what humility is. Humility is thinking rightly about yourself in accordance with God's grace given to us. Tim Keller has this great phrase, humility isn't thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. And Romans 12 says, look, it's not thinking less of yourself, but it's thinking of yourself less and thinking more of God. It's focusing on what God has given you by faith by grace, as a gift in his mercy. And the more that we think of what God has given us, the more it keeps us humble to think how he has blessed us. And there's that little phrase, do that with sober judgment, literally right-minded judgment. I don't know if you've been following, but it's been um, the Women's Football Euro Championships over the past few weeks. And it's, it's, been, it's had a lot of following. It's been really exciting. England have a really good chance of winning The European Championships, better than the men's team, hopefully. But in the team, there are some great individuals. There's there's Ellen White, there's Lucy Bronze, and Nikita Paris, if you know these names. If you don't, don't worry. They're they're just really good players. But right-minded judgment, but sober judgment says, look, you guys are talented, but without the others around you, without the team, without the squad, you're not going to make it. That is the context of our sober judgment here. It's not only looking at the mercy and faith that God has apportioned to us, But in verses 4 and 5, do you see, for just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ, we though many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. It's to remember that we all belong to one body. We step back and realize that every person here, sitting here on your right and your left, who aren't here now, has their part. Every part has their apportioned faith expressed through the gifts that God has given to each and every one of them. God has shown mercy not only to me, but to my brothers and sisters sitting on my right and left. See, the pattern of this world is to compare, to envy, and to try and surpass and step over others in pride. But when we see the body of Christ and God's grace poured out onto each of those around us, when we see the oneness of that body, then whenever we sense envy, we say, no, step back. And look at God's mercy at work in the whole body, in each and every person sitting in this room. To see the beauty of all the parts functioning uniquely 
but in perfect harmony as God intended. See, there's a danger sometimes in churches where we kind of slip into this tiered hierarchy of service in the church, particularly for those ministries that are more upfront. And we tend to value those more highly and think, oh, that's so cool, I'd love to be there. But we need to take a step back and look at God's grace apportioned to each believer as a gift from him. We take a step back and we see the body united in Christ. We look to our right and our left and we realize that we need each and every one of our brothers and sisters. And that leads us to serve one another with humility under God's grace and service to one another. Here's the second thing to remember. We serve in unity. Verse 5, so in Christ we, though many, form one body and each member belongs to all the others. Um, Christmas is long gone, but this is what I got for Christmas last year. This is like my Mary Poppins box today. <laughs> here's, what, here's something I got. It's really cool, this, right? Yeah, oh, there you go. So there's the Tower Bridge, you've got Big Ben, um, London Eye, and I think that's supposed to be Nelson's Column. Right? So it's, it's really cool. It's Lego, Lego architecture. Um, it brought out the inner child in me. It was great. But with all these pieces, you stick them together, and you get this beautiful, united image. Serving in worship means serving in unity. As we take a step back and we see the whole body with all these members, that is what we see, this beautiful picture of this oneness in Christ, united in him and by his blood. One heart, one mind centered, one mind centered on the same person, that is Jesus. So here are some simple things to remember as we serve. When you serve in any team together, pray thanks to God for your brother and sister alongside you. That's something you do whenever you gather as a team. No matter what team it is, music team, welcome team, prayer team, whatever it is, catering team, the first thing you do is you pray together and say, God, thank you for one another. Enter that throne room of God together and say, look, we pray with one heart, one mind, and one voice. So blessed that we have one another to serve. In unity, the second thing to realize is this. As you serve alongside people, when things are feeling low, when things are feeling tough, that is when you really feel God's presence uniting among you. When you're on the back foot and you together lean on God's great mercies, that is when you really encounter God in the depths. And man, will that bring you a bond and a unity that this world cannot give. Paul speaks of that with people like Timothy and Epaphroditus in the book of Philippians. When the going was tough, these guys stood alongside him in service. And you read it and you see this real depth of unity and love and partnership that is built on the foundations of Christ Jesus himself. Solid friendship and unity, even when facing death. The third thing is, is as you serve together, together you start to get a better sense of God's will. What is God's will for us? Not just for me, but for us as a church. A few months ago, we had our vision evening where we rethought about what it means to be the Globe Church in central London. What does that look like? And as a leadership, we try to share with you lots of ideas and saying, "This, this might be what it looks like, but we can't give you all the answers. But here's what we can do. Together, we step out in service to God in all sorts of different ways. And as we do, his will for us as a church will start to become clearer and clearer and clearer. So let's be united. Let's gather together in this and go to serve as a church, as a united body. Here's the third thing. We serve in diversity. Verse 4, for just as each one of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function. Come back to this model here. See, it looks great when it's united, but when you take each of these parts off, they are distinctive. They're quite unique in their own individual way. They're all set for one particular spot in this kind of maze. See, while we have that unity, in it there's this beauty of diversity. We're we're all part of the same body with the same fundamental essence that is Jesus. And yet our expression, our gifting is so, so diverse. We all have different functions. You see that list in verses 6 to 8. And there, there are so many different gifts that Paul lists. Some of those seem more obvious than others, like leading and teaching. We often see those up front in our churches. But then there are other gifts, like serving, which refers specifically to administrative tasks, 
or being encouraging or being merciful. Those are less obvious. But Paul makes it clear. All of these gifts perform different functions, but they are equally important in how we worship together, how we serve one another and serve God in worship. And we are to love that diversity. We've got to learn to love and celebrate how people are different to us, how they can do things that we can't. So here are a couple of practical things for us to consider as we think about serving in diversity. The first thing is this. As a Christian, as part of the body of Christ, no matter how you might feel or think about yourself, you need to hear this, that you are useful, that God has apportioned to you gifts for you to explore and to express. You are an important and needed part of Christ's body. And as you serve in whatever way that is, in wholehearted service, you are worshiping God and displaying his glory in the body of Christ, in all the unity and diversity that we have. That's the first thing to remember. You are useful. The second thing we want to do is encourage one another to be thankful for each other. We are thankful for those 20-odd different teams scattered across the church. They range from cake baking to GDPR to creative teams, to the theology team. There are a whole host of teams with people with all sorts of gifts and backgrounds. And we look at them and we want to praise God for that diversity, for all the different gifts and the functions that we have. And the third thing we do is we pray for more. We pray that more and more would come forwards with the gifts that they have, that God has given to them to express those in the life of the church. If you have those gifts, we'd love to hear from you. Come and speak to me or to anyone on the staff team. We'd love to pray that through with you. As much as we want to generate as many ideas as possible, we are a body, and we want to hear from you guys because you'll have far better ideas than a lot of us will have. The last thing I want to do is, in finishing is, is um, under this general heading of serving in love, uh, working through this little list in verses 9 to 13, just to help us think, actually, more pract- even more practically, what does that look like as we serve one another, as we offer up our bodies as living sacrifices? How can we do that well? Here it is. Love must be sincere, verse 9. At the most basic level, we serve in love. We have God's love in view as we serve each other, but we realize that serving together is a great way to express and share that love with one another. Through the ups and downs, the joys and struggles that we experience as we serve and share in God's great mercies, through that we start to build deeper and deeper bonds, deeper friendships as we serve, as we fight and contend for the faith. So remember that serving is a great way to express that love for one another. That is the most basic level. But in that then, love must be sincere or genuine. I want want you to hear this right. When we... We've been talking a lot about what it means to serve, but I want you to be clear that all of this chat isn't about trying to get you guilt, guilt tripping you into serving. That is not what I'm trying to do. I don't want us to be running ourselves into the ground and burning out. That is the last thing that we want. But we want to serve out of love, in genuine love, sincerity. Sincerity that says, hey, maybe you just need to take a break and step back from that. You're working too hard. Sincerity that can push people to think, do you think you could actually serve more? Sincerity that says, look, are you conforming to the patterns of the world? Or do you want to serve more renewed in the mind? Sincerity that looks out for one another in genuine love because we want to help each other serve and worship. Verse 10, be devoted to one another in love. We stand firm and have each other's backs no matter what because of Jesus. We never abandon our brothers and sisters. We look out for one another. We're devoted to each other. We pray, we meet up, we encourage. We see when they're finding things tough and we go and devote ourselves to them. Second half of verse 10, honor one another. It means we honor each other. We think of others more highly than ourselves. We value them, we praise them in public. Perhaps you write a note or a card of saying thanks to them. But here's something else you can do in honoring them, is to honor them in private. In your prayers, bring them before God in thanksgiving. Say, Father, I'm so grateful for this person, for their gifts and their service. That is a beautiful way to honor others. 
Verse 11, it means we never lack in zeal. If you aren't serving at the moment or you feel like you could do more, here's something you could do. Be zealous in responding to emails that come around saying, can you help? Or come and grab someone on the staff team and ask them, look, is there something I can do to help out? That is a great way to love the body of Christ. Be joyful, patient, and faithful, verse 12. Particularly when things aren't what you quite expected, when things are hard. We serve one another with the joy that comes from God's mercies, with the patience reflected in God's merciful patience with us, and in faithful prayer that is reliant on God's grace and his strength, not ours. And finally, verse 13, we give practical help. We share with the Lord's people who are in need. We practice hospitality. The thing is, the more we serve together, the more you'll start knowing what the needs of the church body are. The more you'll need, know the people around you and you'll know what you need to share in to support them and encourage them. The more you'll know what I need to give of my time and resources to help these people. And that's when we can really practice hospitality, beyond just inviting them around for lunch, but inviting them to share love and care with them in a deep way. Serving God can often be hard. And so we generously provide comfort and care for one another as we do that. And that is a wonderful way that we can love and serve each other. Look, there's, there's lots of stuff that I've just thrown at you. Rather than trying to pick up on all the things, perhaps there's just one thing that you want to pick up on and think, that is something I'd love to be praying for. I'd love to do more of. But in all of this, those are all the ways that helps us to serve God, to serve one another and encounter him together more richly and deeply. Serving is worship. Serving is a key way to encounter God and see more clearly what his will is. And so in view of God's great mercy, can we all offer up our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God? Guys, let's, let's go and do that. Let's go and do that with love and humility. Let's go and do that delighting in the unity and the diversity that he's given us. Let's encounter God together as the Globe Church, as we serve him and we serve one another for his glory. Let's pray together. Father, please help us to see what it means to encounter you as we serve, to know that serving is worship, to know that as we serve, we not only encounter you more richly and deeply, but we see more clearly what your will is. Father, please, would you as a, help us as a church to unite and gather in our unity and, and our diversity in humility and in love to serve you wholeheartedly so that we might encounter you more deeply and richly. And we pray this for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.